Uh, good morning. <coughs> good morning, everybody. <coughs> I hope this is reaching out to the back, is it? Good. Um, before we start describing the Kirkyard survey, um, which is a very appropriate following on from Keel Chapel, <coughs> we want to say something about how our project developed. Our Fortingo Roots project is a coming together of a few local bodies to find out more about the history and archaeology and folklore of Fortingal and to spread the word about how special a place it is. The main players are the Bridalban Heritage Society, founded over 50 years ago in Aberfeldy, the James McLaren Society, which researches and publicizes the work of the architect uh, responsible for the village, and the Fortigal and Glenline Kirk Session, um, who of course are interested in the Kirkyard. Coordinating these to help with the fundraising, the Bredalban Development Association. Maybe Fortingall is a hidden gem. Um, we've just had s somebody coming wanting to do a, a, a television program for about undiscovered Scotland. So we're not sure if it's undiscovered or not. Um, we had one just about a month ago when Freddie Flintoff of cricketing fame came to do another program about it. But if anybody's heard of it, it's probably because of our famous yew tree. Uh, the oldest in Scotland, the world, Europe, take your pick, anything between two to 5,000 years old. Um, it wasn't quite voted Scotland's favorite tree. It was beaten by a certain osprey in Dunkeld. But um, we also heard about our picturesque Thatched cottages, just like Devon, people say. You don't get thatch in Scotland, do you? You don't notice how delicately the different facets of Scottish building traditions are combined by this McLaren's iconic cottage. I suspect uh, up to a few years ago, um, or even maybe still, people from Creef would have come on a day trip up through the Smar Glen and have tea at Fortigal Hotel. Built in 1890 by McLaren's successors done in Watson to McLaren's original design. Maybe some folk associate Fortingal with Campbell of Glen Line of Glencoe notoriety. And a few know that the first collection of Gaelic songs was done by the Dean of Lismore, who was actually the vicar of Fortingall um, just before the Reformation. And those of an antiquarian turn of mind know that the fertile vale of Fortingall was full of archaeological interest, standing stones overlooked by a clifftop fort, now obscured by rhododendrons. Beside it, there's a massive ring homestead, and in down in the valley, another, uh, how does this work? Yes. Um, medieval homestead moat, uh, all kinds of um, cairns. This is the Neolithic cairn, got a hut circle down here. Uh, Bronze Age, what I would call a mini henge with a, a cut mark stone in it and a Bronze Age cemetery which has never been excavated. Well, none of this has ever been excavated and a little, what looks like a kist in the Bronze Age cemetery. All this was known in the past as uh, the Roman camp. They thought the medieval homestead um, 
obviously could only be the praetorium of a Roman camp. Um, but I won't say anything about the Romans and Pontius Pilate. But what happened was that the um, special importance came round about the church when the aerial photographs that the Royal Commission have showed crop marks in the fields that seemed to mark a uh, vallum, the boundary of an early monastery from where presumably the Irish monk's bell kept in the kirk had come from. Thus the fields around the church became a scheduled monument. There was renewed interest in the heritage of Fortingal in 1997 with the analysis of early Christian stones kept in the kirk and the kirkyard by Neil Robertson in the book The Worm, the Germ and the Thorn. Uh, Neil Robertson in the Pictish Art Society of, also of an uncanny skill in finding more stones with crosses in the kirkyard, which is partly the inspiration for what comes later. Then around the millennium, cuttings were taken from the yew. Some of them are now part of the yew hedge that's being planted in the Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. Incised paving stones were laid as a path to the yew. A new display of the crosses, the Pictish crosses, was arranged in the church and fine drawings made of them by Ian Scott. For the centenary of the rebuilt church in 2002, the church arranged an exhibition of history of the church and village. Material gathered for this with the help of Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust was the basis of a new Kirk and Village guidebook, which is now uh, into its, going into its third edition, the second edition just uh, out of print. <clears throat> In another collaboration between the Kirk and the Heritage Societies, the grave of the influential um, late 18th century minister, the Reverend Duncan Macara, below the yew tree, was um, revealed. Then in 2003, Alan Calder published his monograph on the work of James McLaren. Calder's book finally established McLaren's importance in the arts and crafts movement and in Scottish architecture as a major influence on better known figures like Charles Rennie Mackintosh and Robert Lorimer. Some of us then started the James McLaren Society. Here's volume two showing the bell pool on the hotel, um, which was in a fragile state, so the society had a copy made by Rathal Forge and the original given to the, um, the National Museum. We've now got up to volume 12 of the McLaren Journal. Um, then in 2007, there was an archaeological investigation of part of the scheduled site when there were drain works there, and that's now been written up in the latest Tafak Journal. And then in 2010, Oliver O'Grady asked for local volunteers to help with the geophysical survey of the scheduled site. The results of this indicated not only a significant vallum, but a complex of buildings, sorry, I'll go back, complex of buildings inside it. In 2011, Dr. O'Grady returned to excavate what seemed to be two significant sections of the vallum, east of the church, here, and south of the hotel, in the, in the, in the field south of the hotel, which was eventually... Um, here is the opening of the of the dig on the east side in the Glebe field. 
and here is the, the trench outside um, the hotel, which was eventually interpreted as the entrance. But on the east side, the sto these stones were revealed as a vallum, as the, sorry, the revetment of the vallum, which would have, the mound, the embankment would have been here, and they're excavating this ditch, and the ditch went down and down to over one and a half meters. Now, if you think of a ditch being one and a half meters deep, and the earth from this would be piled up as the embankment, that means that anybody coming along um, would have encountered something almost an obstacle of about three meters, plus probably a fence on the top. This was something really significant. How many ma man hours, how many men were involved in building this? Um, we think of these early uh, missionaries from Iona as little sort of pilgrims wandering by themselves through the Pictish countryside, but there must have been an army here to build this. It gives a meaning to the name Fortingal, which is nowadays um, interpreted as Ferterkill, the stronghold church. People think, well, maybe this refers to the, the forts on the hill, but it's actually, this presumably is a stronghold church. According to O'Grady, the carbon dating dates it back to the late 7th century, just at the time of St. Adamnon, the Bishop of Iona and biographer of Columba, who local tradition says was the missionary in our area. And also there were later, later dates, so perhaps it was rebuilt at the time of the Norse incursions and sub subsequent political problems in Alaba. Um, we were so excited by these results locally that we began discussing how to organize and raise funds for more investigations and formed the Fortingal Roots Project. But we were so carried away with what we could do um, that we found it difficult to see the way forward. After discussions with Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust, we decided to cut our teeth on a more limited objective. Fortigal Kirk wanted to find a way of sheltering some of the old stones, some of them have got fascinating triple crosses, which were scattered around the kirkyard. But we were advised that first we should do an accurate survey of the kirkyard and find out if there were more old stones beneath the grass, using the techniques worked out by the Murray Graveyard Research Group. Here's Andrew Driver of the P&K Heritage Trust discussing this with us in the kirkyard. Here's the manual of instructions which we were to follow. We invited members of the Murray Group to come down and advise us. Here's one of them demonstrating perhaps the most important of the special tools required, the plastic-tipped probe used to establish if there was a stone no more than four or maybe six inches below the surface. First, we had to clear the masses of ivy on the kirkyard dikes. One of the things this mammoth task revealed was this stray stone, one of the many stones with a D, R on them, probably a Duncan Robertson. We were also intrigued by this more modern monument that the rampant ivy had obscured to Alexander Patterson Somerville from Glasgow. Now, why was this Glasgow man buried in Fortingal? He was the donor of the St. Mungo Prize for leading citizens of that city. The inscription narrates that he wished his ashes to be buried beside the grave 
of his lifelong friend, James Jack, who had died in Fortingal during the war, the Second World War. This is just one of the many stories that come out of the inscriptions. We were able to contact a representative of the family who came and showed us this photo of Somerville and also some of the many paintings that he'd done in Perthshire on his visits here. Now, we are lucky to have on the Fortingal Roots team Claire Thomas, the professional archaeologist and previous chair of the Bredalban Heritage Society. She makes sure that everything is done in the correct way. In the summer of 2013, we began our survey laying out a grid and marking accurately the position of all the stones which were each given an individual number. We were then able to start recording each stone, like uh, Rosie's doing here, using the Council for Scottish Archaeology recording form, with the composition and position of the stone with an exact copy of the inscription and, as far as possible, any decoration or symbols on the stone. This takes time, and after our main session was over, members of the team continued to come and record more of the stones over the autumn and the next spring. In April this year, we began our survey again, spending a week probing the turf to locate any buried stones. We started at the east end of the Kirkyard, where we soon came across these slabs. They are quite blank, but good quality and finely dressed. From the adjoining headstone to a Duncan Robertson, we can surmise that these slabs are part of a Robertson lair. In the later 18th century, the Clan Donaghy chiefs lived at Dunneaves just across the River Line from the village. It was the only part of their estates left to them after the 45. So we wouldn't be surprised to find good quality slabs there. But why are there no marks on them? All these stones were recorded, photographed, drawn. We found other rough slabs nearby. Sorry, it's going backwards. Um, with the initials DR roughly carved on them, probably other Duncan Robertsons. Duncan being a popular forename, presumably, for the Clan Donaghy. But most slabs we found were completely blank. Was it not thought proper and Presbyterian then to identify yourself on the stone covering your grave? Or, unlike at Keel, maybe there just wasn't enough money and masons to carve the, the initials? To the west of the Robertson Ground, we near to headstones for later 19th century MacGregors, were some more blank stones, but one with IMG, maybe a John McGregor, carved. There's another DR beside it. Either there was an overlap on the layers or slabs had been lifted and put down somewhere else. With all these slabs often touching each other, and with other slabs left alongside the walls, it was becoming clear that the headsto headstones had not become common in Fortingal until the second half of the 19th century, that before then the whole burial ground had been covered by such slabs. On only one was there any symbol or decoration. When this was uncovered, the cry went up, it's an axe, looks like a tomahawk. But when we emailed the picture round, uh, we were immediately told, no, that is a plough. And um, was this AR, a farmer, a ploughman, or a writer who specialised in making ploughs or coulters? All these revealed stones plotted on the sketch were carefully recovered with the turf we'd taken off. In June, we took part in the archaeology month being shown around the churchyard, 
and in terrible weather in the fields, in, in the archaeology. When we resumed our work in August, we were preparing for visits by school groups, hoping we'd have some interesting stones to, for them to find. Here we're carefully probing regular intervals along the strings, marking where we felt resistance. There might be stones, cutting squares of turf to see what was underneath, and again and again it was tightly packed ground, uh, gravel that had misled us. Um, we were wonder, hoping that there'd be some inscriptions for the school pupils to find. Luckily, we struck gold, or at least initials and dates. Here's um, the Pitlochry High School. We're ex excited to unearth the initials DC, Duncan Cameron, maybe, and G. McN, maybe a McNaughton wife, and the date, 1752. The second group working on their stone exclaimed, we've beaten you, 1710, for an earlier Duncan Cameron. Bad weather was forecast for the Bredalban Academy visit, so we set up a shelter, and again we seemed to find only rough blank stones, but the pupils were remarkably enthusiastic despite the rain, and they were rewarded with this one. We weren't sure whether this, there were two ends at the beginning of this, but they were recorded just in case. Come October, the autumn crocuses came up over where we disturbed them in the spring, so we'd done quite well in putting back the turf. Just very quickly, a few of the upright stones. This is one of the few with the symbols of mortality. Why is this lady called the charitable Grizzle Stewart, spouse to Alexander MacDougall, who is a grazier? Now this is significant because he was one of the new breed of sheep farmers. He was probably well off enough to afford to put up a stone for his wife, a fashion he may have imported along with the sheep. And this one, another McNaughton, a mason. Maybe he's the mason who was carving the stones, but whoever's carved his stone has got the letters the wrong way round. There's an is and his N. It's also wrong. What next? Uh, we still have what may be the most interesting part of the kirkyard to test for stones. Then we have put we have to put everything together for visitors. We can add to what we have information they bring about their families. And we hope we can get all this digital as well. I can imagine people in the future coming to a stone and swiping it with their smartwatch and getting all the information about the family. More practically, we have to protect the historic stone, some in a shelter, some where they are. In the long term, we have all these other sites around Fortingal to investigate, and especially the important example of the early Celtic monastery. Last year, Oliver O'Grady, doing a separate investigation of the east end of the church, found evidence that, in fact, it might be even earlier in date, uh, the time of St. Columba, and thus one of the earliest Christian sites in the area. Thank you. Hope it hasn't been too long. <laughs> oh, thank you.